Yes, hello, and welcome to Release the Creative, your favorite podcast about cognition, creativity, and this week's Cinnamon Snaps, Synapse, and Synonyms. Can you do that twice in a row? Uh, synonym and snap, synapse and synonym, synonym and snap, synapse and so no, no. I, I for the record, I was a little bit surprised I could do it the first you time. Held it the first time. Synonym and snap, synapse and synonyms. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna spend the next half hour uh, breaking, breaking that down. That down. Well, actually, no. We're gonna spend the next half hour talking about the fact that a that's really fun to say. You should try synonym and snap, synapse and synonyms. Um, and this is going to be a very meandering episode, and people are going to be like, oh my gosh, it was like a 30 minute long tangent. And that's actually, in this particular case, the point. Almost the point. It's we, interestingly, draw strange associations in our brain, and, and everyone does, like literally everyone. And so we take these things that have nothing to do with each other, and we slam them together. And sometimes we do it on purpose, and we call that creativity. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we do it uh, uh, unintentionally, and we call that like conflation. Like it just, they have not, for example, panda bears. Not bears. Koala bears. Also not bears. Uh, koala bears are marsupials, and panda bears are actually giant, f like, fox badger things. I think badgers, actually. Okay, so what about corn dog? Well, that one almost counts, because, like, it is a hot dog, but it's... Well, it has corn on it. And it's in corn batter. It's okay, like, so it's, that, it's, that it's, corn, it's in cornmeal. Corn dog's off the list. Yeah, no, because, like, that one's an actual valid. It's in a cornmeal-covered hot dog. Just descriptive. Yeah. I mean... But no, I mean, think about this for a second. Think about all the things in life that we call things that have nothing to do with other things. And and sometimes we do it on purpose. And it's it's meant to be funny. It's meant to be interesting. It's meant to be explanatory, uh, like panda bear. We call them, pan even though they are not related to bears, we call them that because they, they look like teddy bears. They're adorable. They're also stupid. They should have died out millions, of, thousands of years ago. The only reason pandas are still exist is that we think they're cute so we keep them from going extinct that's a hundred percent true it's a good strategy for them oh yeah it's like if i'm just cute they'll save me <laughs> they'll keep feeding me as long as i'm adorable that's like their entire evolutionary strategy uh but like chinese checkers from germany right not chinese <laughs> <laughs> or or related to checkers in any way it's you know uh the fortune cookie also not really from china but that's um we have these weird conflation facts like uh, what was we were talking the other day, uh, the Panama hat is from Ecuador. Really? Yeah. <laughs> the Panama hat's from Ecuador. It was first uh, started being used by Americans during the digging of the Panama Canal. They were getting like yellow fever and all this crazy stuff. And the Panama hat kept the bugs off and the sun off and everything. So they started wearing these hats and they're like, oh, yeah, these these hats from Panama. But they weren't. But now we use them as descriptors. But that's a it's a misnomer. It's a conflation of data that we've just kind of applied right and it's actually so today i just want to talk about like all the things that, that are that are wrong in the world uh cinnamon snap synapse and synonyms because right. well if it's wrong long enough it becomes right again though i guess right? uh, <laughs> that's how language changes but you're talking about things that change for no for a non-logical reason <laughs> no i mean so like one that, like let, let's start with one that just straight up doesn't matter decimate annihilate and eradicate are relatively synonymous in our in our usage, mm -hmm. at least in modern English, except etymologically, uh, very different definitions. <laughs> decimate means to go down by one tenth, one decimal place. Yeah, decimate. No, no one uses it that no way. No one uses <laughs> Like, if you're like, my army was decimated, I'd be like, you really only lost one tenth? He'd probably punch me. <laughs> like, he should punch me. Whereas uh, annihilate means basically utter destruction, and eradicate means wiped from the face of the earth. Like, if we were talking in actual, like, Real specifics, Base. yeah. But they've become synonyms. So in a lot of times, with things like decimate, eradicate, annihilate, it doesn't matter. But with things like literally and figuratively, it does, Jeff. Bring back literally and make literally mean literally again. <laughs> literally, literally is gone. <laughs> there, there's no literally anymore. It all just means figuratively, according to even dictionaries. Dictionaries lie to you. They do. They're lying to you. So yeah, but they... So one, one thing will happen is we change the definition to to mean what the word means. Like... Like I said, uh, annihilate it, or or like cinnamon. The, the reason I, I the episode's called Cinnamon Snaps is that a huge percentage of Americans have never eaten cinnamon, and everyone's like, "Uh, yes, I have. I've had a Christmas cookie. I've had gingerbread." Yeah, I feel like cinnamon's pretty popular. Right? No, that's that's cassia. Yeah. It's 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 at a similar botanical uh, root, but it's from a different country and it tastes remarkably different. It's just cheaper to, to, to harvest. So what does cinnamon taste like? <laughs> uh, it's earthier. It's, you can get it in America. You have to go to like a bake shop. Like if you go to a grocery store, you're going to get cassia. And it'll even say on it, if you look at your McCormick thing, it'll be like, it'll be like cinnamon, 
Kasha yeah. under it. Whereas Ceylon cinnamon, C E Y L O N, Ceylon cinnamon is actual, the actual cinnamon spice. Uh, it's earthier. It it doesn't taste like. It is distinctly different. I like Kasha better. Do we know where? Do we know when that happened? <laughs> um, it, it, short answer is when I looked into it, like somewhere in the like you know, East India Trading Company kind of. Import, export of moving things around. The short answer is no. Someone's going to fact check me and like, he's an idiot. But uh, I, I knew at one point, I don't have it on the top of my head, but it's, we we conflate these terms and we, and sometimes it's just a shortcut. We're like panda bear, because it looks cute. That's easy. Yeah. yeah. Koala bear, again, looks like a teddy bear, looks cute. Starfish. Star, starfish and jellyfish, nowhere, not even sort of related to fish, but in that one, we're like, it's in the water. It's a fish, Kirk, calm down. <laughs> And, and that makes sense. It's so a lot of these things are are your brain automatically making these these synapse connections. They're like, oh, water, fish looks like jelly, jelly, fish done <laughs> in the water. Looks like a star, starfish nailed it. <laughs> and that's not true. And then things like, you know, botanically berries are defined as one thing, whereas uh, dietetically, not dietetically, culinary. uh, culinarily, the, it's it's different. So. Uh, you know, technically, botanically, a banana is a berry, which hurts my brain. An and eggplant. A strawberry is not a berry. And a strawberry, botanically, is not a berry. Whereas culinarily, strawberry, raspberry, blackberry, blueberry, Art. berries, yeah. and a banana is just a fruit. But botanically, that's not true. And so, so some of it's just pedantic. And I'll even I, the king of pedantic, get that. It's like you're just harping on details for no reason. And so, and like, and in the grand keeping of, as I said, you know, kind of being all over the place. And again, it's by design is because our brain just reaches out and grabs connections. It's just like, oh, I know what to name something. Anchor point. I got you. You know, better let go check. Like we have, see, like that totally random connection. Uh, Titanic 1996 for those who missed it. So. Uh, Second week in a row Titanic has come up, isn't it? Is it really? <laughs> talked to, no, two, two weeks ago we talked about Titanic. Huh. I forget why. Cool. Um. <laughs> But uh, the other thing that we do is we take a word, panda bear, and we just apply it to anything that it sort of works. Starfish, jellyfish, panda bear, uh, koala bear. And we're like, oh, jello. Jello's a brand for gelatin. It's gelatins with a G, jello's with a J. But like jello is what else? We, what would you call jello? You're not going to say gelatin dessert. That's yeah, that's a distant second. <laughs> like or, or thermos. Like what would you even go about calling a thermos, which is a brand? Is it is it my vacuum sealed liquid transportation device? Screw you, man. That's not happening. Like, <laughs> excuse me. Can I have that double wall insulated like that? Like, no, it's a thermos. <laughs> They've made a word so well, it's become a noun. Even though it's it's a misnomer, it's it's des describing a large quantity of things with a name that is only spent, meant to define a fraction. Yeah, there's a well, ton of devices, or it's popular in toys too, right? Like right. Um, frisbee came from the original, the pie tins that were yep. then they were toys, and now everything you throw is a frisbee. Yeah, like you know, so um, it's you know, oh, it's frisbee golf. No, it's not. It's disc golf, Kirk. <laughs> it's disc golf. I mean, it's I've golf. never looked into it. I'm assuming Slinky is a brand name, but uh, if you have any kind Ooh. of a spring a toy, I'm sure people would call that a, a Slinky regardless. That's true. I was watching a really cool TikTok where people like Slinky juggling. It was really amazing. But that's <laughs> it. again, your brain is always looking for these shortcuts, these, these, how can I quickly, and, and whereas I'm in no way justifying what I'm about to say, this is where racism comes up. This is where prejudice comes up. You're like, if I can quickly associate all things in this category, with a shortcut, I'm going to. It's data compression for it's, your brain. <laughs> it's in the water. It's a fish. I don't care that it's a mammal. That's a big fish. That's a killer whale, sir. It's a fish. Like, <laughs> and and we have to. No, no, no. That that that's a mammal, and that's a fish. And because when when it works, it really works. When you're studying for your chemistry exam, like being able to make that connection from A to B to C and helps you remember a lot of like, it's a great thing when it works. But then it goes out in the real world and kind of screws you up. We love shortcuts. We love the difference between heuristics and algorithms. Uh, really fast for those who aren't, well, me and or super nerdy, an algorithm is a structured order of steps, which is not necessarily efficient, but will 100% of the time find the answer. And a heuristic is a logic based assumption, which is usually far more efficient, but is much more prone to error. 
quickest example of that is if you are going into a grocery store looking for marshmallow fluff, the algorithmic would be you go down row A, row B, row C, row D, looking up and down at a structure. You will find them. You, there's a 100% chance of finding the marshmallow fluff. 100%. You will not miss it. It can't be. But if you have an if you have a poor structured list of grocery items and you do that for all of them, you're going to be all over the place. It's going to be very crazy. Or, But if you do it heuristically, heuristically it's like, I need marshmallow fluff. I'm going to walk in. Where would that be? Candy or baking aisles? I think baking. Yeah. So I'm going to go I baking. literally did this a month ago for marshmallow fluff. And I, <laughs> I I'm right. a heuristic person. I yeah. searched, um, where did I go first? I went condiments first. Interesting. And ketchup. Then I went, well, no, baking goods first. Uh, the and it wasn't sugar, there? That's where flour. I usually find it. No, it wasn't there. Um, and it wasn't condiments. Then, see, here's where I got screwed up. In the ice cream aisle, they had one of those special displays that right. had certain items, but they didn't have the big, the, the, the big fluff. craft jar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had like a little expensive one. Right, it was right. like a little jar like for a like drizzle. eight dollars. Right. No, and I was like, no, I want the big three dollar one. Yeah, had you done it algorithmically, A, B, would have been faster. <laughs> in this case, it would have been faster. But you don't know until you try. But you don't know. So 99% of people are heuristic. But a heuristic is, okay, where should I look for this first, second, third, fourth? What is the most logical hierarchy? And the reason all this matters is that what we can start doing is accidentally uh, accidentally bridging these gaps. We're like, oh, well, first I'm going to check, uh, first I'm going to check uh, baking goods, and second I'm going to check international foods. So like, well, wait, wait. <laughs> Why? Like, oh, because, and then you have some weird justification. You're like, I still don't understand how you got to, to <laughs> international foods for marshmallow fluff. Like, what country do you think that internet, like, it's probably the most American thing ever. It's whipped sugar. This is where cognitive dissonance comes in. This is where, where we, we lump things together and we group them, we group them, we group them. We're like, and this bucket, this bucket, this bucket, this bucket, this bucket. And we come up with these shortcuts, koala bear, starfish, uh, Panama hat. Like, and we give things the wrong name and we, we change things because we're, it's like you said, it's data compression on a cognitive level. It's, I'm going to make this as quick as possible, but now not all the connections are clean. Yeah. And this causes three different problems slash benefits slash the one, the buckets you're putting, you and I were raised relatively similarly. Like I'm military, you're not, but other than that, like we went to high school together. We have lived in relatively the same socioeconomic bracket. We're both white, like cis white males. We're both, yeah. we've had relatively, but you and I don't categorize things the same at all. <laughs> it throws you off a lot. It throws me off way more than it throws you off. You're just used to the crazy by this point. But the problem there is now I am categorizing things and categorizing, and we start using the same words for them, but, but they're, they're not the same. Yeah. They're, they're misaligned. They're incorrect. So we're, we're divided by a common language because I think it's like, yeah, well, go get some marshmallow fluff. And you're like, cool, baking aisle. And you go in and it's like, no, international foods. You're like, why would it be international foods? My, um, my wife uh, is oftentimes on your end of the mental <laughs> and yes, whenever I come home and complain about how something I looked for was in like the fourth place I looked, yeah. she's always like, that's where I would have gone first yeah. <laughs> every time. And so like heuristics are a real thing, and but we build our own heuristics. Algorithms are, are set out. We can build our own ag algorithms, but algorithms are, are a set tutorialized. They're a tutorialized set. Um, you know, re like you see how I feel about tutorialized sets, but heuristics are self-developed. You're you're like, oh, I'm going to go in the order that I feel this is most logical, that will be the most efficient. But those are greatly, greatly influenced by your background, your experiences. Um, uh, I think the best example of this, and I had no idea I was going to use this example for this, is if you watch if you watch uh, the Keenan Williams, Keenan Saturday Night Live, Keenan. Thompson. Thompson. Thank yes. you. <laughs> Keenan Thompson's Black Jeopardy right. and watch the one with Tom Hanks and and uh, Chadwick Boseman back to back. Yeah. And it's this is the same show. It's the same joke. One with MAGA hat wearing redneck Tom Hanks and one with T'Challa, King of Wakanda. And you see how they ask basically these same questions and their their associative sets are so, so, so different. And that's the joke. That's the laughing point. But in Saturday Night Live's example, it's the punchline, but what we don't realize is that everyone is doing that 100% of the time, all day, every day, every, every turn, every single turn. And the coolest part about this, which we will talk about, like kind of after the break, is that whereas th that is a huge stumbling block in heuristics, it's actually the wellspring of creativity. That is actually where creativity, the, the, the stumbling block of cognitive dissonance is actually in a lot of ways the 
the gold mine of creative wealth. So we're gonna exploit a loophole where in your brain. our brains are broken and we dive into that and that's where creativity comes from. Uh, short answer. That's the short, short version. Yeah, yeah. All right, well we're gonna take a break and we will talk more about that when we get back. Cool. Hey, Jeff and I wanted to take a minute just here at the top of the show to say thank you for joining us on our new podcast and YouTube show, Release the Creative. Whether you're new to our brand of crazy or you followed us over from one of our other social media platforms, LinkedIn, Twitch, Facebook, or Twitter, we'd like to thank you for joining us here. Please take this moment to hit the subscribe and the like button and also that funny little notification button so that you can be uh, notified of all our new episodes. We're really trying to get this new show up on the road. Thank you so much for watching. All right, and we are back for part two of the title I cannot even begin to Cinnamon pronounce. snaps, synaps, and synonyms. That one, yeah. No, and uh, for the record, I, I had to like bend really hard to make that title work just because I really wanted to say it. Um, <laughs> it didn't come naturally. It didn't come naturally, but it's just really, it's just, it sounds so free. Cinnamon snaps, synaps, and synonyms. Um, so we have these heuristics and these algorithms, and we have the co this cognitive dissonance, and it's caused by the fact that your brain is running multiple levels of, of calculations, both physical and mental and socio, uh, you know, interpersonal at the same time. So it is just looking for the cheapest, dirtiest, and easiest cut, and it does that by being a prediction engine. The reason you don't remember every breath you've ever taken is because relatively mundane. Like you don't you don't remember any of your heartbeats unless, oh, I remember that one time my heart was pounding so hard I thought it would burst from my chest. You remember those moments? Yeah, the outliers. The outliers, because your brain is not going to mem uh, remember every breath you took, every step you took. Those are boring. It doesn't even remember every meal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it really doesn't. It remembers the things that are prediction errors. It remembers the things that are outliers. Um, and so brain freeze. So, so what the whole point there is that we need to give it lots to draw from. We need to give it lots of information, um, across a diverse, uh, diverse field because it gives us more things to predict. It gives us more thing. It, yes, it gives us both more things to remember, which is kind of bad, but it gives us a, a broader scope of, of things to kind of connect that to. Um, do you know who Liz Coleman is? I think I remember hearing that name, but no, I don't know who so she Liz is. So Liz Coleman, she is an educator. She did an amazing TED Talk in 2009. You should look this up, Liz Coleman, L-I-Z is, you know, should you care about the, there's lots of ways to spell Liz, but L-I-Z, uh, L-I-Z, L -I -Z, <laughs> L -I, okay, but it's an I, it's a Liz Coleman. Um, and she did this TED Talk that I absolutely love where she talks about how the true death and travesty of the death of the inter, uh, of the interdisciplinary education. When we say a liberal arts ed education, like, oh yes, you've got a <laughs> liberal arts education. It's like a slur now. It basically means, so you wasted four years of your time getting a degree in liberal basket weaving. art, basket weaving, yeah. like, oh, that's so funny. You got a liberal arts education. And if you really look at the liberal arts education in the true sense of the word, not in the, the more modern application of it, is actually what we should be striving for. Like right now it's really, really popular to not go to college and you're like, oh no, just go out there and do it, which is fine. It, it, it super is. But as long as you're giving yourself your own liberal arts education, if all you do is go out and get laser focused on your goal and do everything like that, that's bad. That's if all you know is the, the thing you do, you'll never get there because you don't get better at something by only doing that. You get better at it by doing other stuff. Yeah, they, they say in any creative pursuits is you know learn something other right than that. Like get a get a broad view. Yeah. Right. Like I mean, so like Ansel Adams is a beautiful photographer. Best one of the best photographers. One of the photographers that one of the few photographers. You know, Anna Leibovitz, Ansel Adams. Most people are then ask them to name a third. I, I can name more <laughs> photographers, but most people are like, and I'm out. Yeah. But neither of them was only a good photographer, which is to say. Uh, Ansel Adams, let's stick with there. What he also was, was a true outdoorsman. He, the photography is the one part that he excelled at, but knowing the sunsets, the sun times, the landscapes, the, the house and the, the only reason his, pic, his pictures inside of a dark room would have been a picture of a dark room. The, what made they were awesome was combining multiple, was combining aspects of his, yeah. 
same thing with every photographer. Like, oh yeah, this guy's an amazing photographer. Right, but it's not his ability to take the picture. It's his ability to choose which picture to take. It's a picture of, of what person to take a picture of, what hillside, what, what house, what whatever. Uh, that's interdisciplinary. That isn't, well, all I studied was photography. That might be all you got your education in, but you learned other things. Something else too, yeah. This You see this a lot with, uh, there's a reason that the world of independent filmmaking is almost like is 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 oversaturated with movies about young kids trying to make an independent film <laughs> because usually guilty guilty usually these kids were 12 and 13 years old when they decided to make movies and they started make, learning about how to make movies and how to make movies and reading about making movies and studying about making movies and suddenly they're 18 19 20 22 in my case and they come out of film school and they're like i'm gonna make a movie about that's what they know <laughs> i don't know how to do anything except make movies and that's all i've ever wanted so let's make a movie about making a movie. That'll be cool. People will love that. Everyone I know would want to watch that because everyone you know makes movies. Yeah. Like, but the way that you, so true creativity isn't found in the mastering of a single skill. True creativity is out of the breadth of knowledge of, of lots of different things. You know, you hear, you talk about early Steve Jobs, early Steve Jobs. And again, I, I hate just using, just recycling his stories, but they tend to resonate with people. You know, after he dropped out of college, he uh, he attributes a lot of his success to going in and auditing or dropping in on a calligraphy class yeah. taught by an old a, a former monk that had left the order to get married. But um, and then when his wife died, after many many years, he went back to the order. For the record, if you oh, didn't know that part of the story, I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, um, and he talks about how that that time studying the kerning and the letting and the swiping and the, and the and the beauty and the structure and the symmetry of letters helped him better understand a lot of different things and helped him understand the graphical interface and when he developed the first word processor that's why we have 35,000 fonts is cuz the beauty of fonts was important to him yeah it didn't come from him i'm so glad i sat down and read another book that day about computer programming it came from radically diverse knowledge yeah, a lot of people don't know, uh, it depends on how old our audience is, but a lot of <laughs> people don't know that, uh, you know, in the 80s, the Macintosh became the de facto computer for uh, print and publishing and a lot of the graphics arts, and it wasn't a coincidence. Um, right. It was because the Mac was the first computer, or at least commercially available computer that wasn't, you know, high-end business use that you could buy and you could design something and it would come out on a printer looking the same way right. as on the screen. Um, other systems didn't do that, which sounds crazy now because everything we do is so is so, so perfect across the right. board. But back then, monitors were generally three, 400 pixels across. So you were dealing with very few pixels on screen and you still had thousands of points of ink and a printer. And right. so there's a mismatch between what you're seeing- The resolution, the DPI. Yeah. They don't match. And so a lot of computers, they did a strict interpretation of this pixel goes here, this pixel goes there. And um, whenever there's a curve, the computer has to make a choice. Right. And uh, with most other machines, the choice was done like algorithmically, and you would get jaggy and stuff doesn't line up right. And the Mac was the one that that's like, okay, we're going to treat it like a photograph of a font. Right. And it come when you print it, it's what you saw on the screen. And yes, yeah, so all of that was from what you just said. It's because he right. cared about we, that. And the thing is that. That came from diverse knowledge. And, you know, and again, nowadays we roll our eyes and like, oh, he has a degree in sociology or liberal arts or, <laughs> or, or, and, and we kind of, you know, hold our nose up. He's like, yeah, he took all these brain dead courses. And I was like, now, if truly you're going and your, your intent is to take underwater basket weaving and physics of a frisbee and total blow off courses, then yes, that's, that's, that's bad. That's different. Don't, don't do that. But, but studying up, um, the actual true truth to actual creativity is having an understanding of everything that you can possibly understand. You know, if you want to be a great artist, you need to be able to draw a peach and a person and a landscape because drawing a landscape better will actually help you draw a person better. Not because they're related skills in any way, but hand control is hand control and understanding of architecture and shape is architecture and shape. And that's still being super narrow within one field. If all you do is draw people, all your people will look the same and they will become homogenous. And, and so if we want to get truly creative, this same hack that causes cognitive dissonance and these shortcuts and these, they, they like these heuristic and algorithms 
what we actually need to do is, is hack that. We need to say, okay, if my brain is going to try to lump things into categories, I need to do two different things and you need to do them super intentionally. One, give your brain as many categories that interest you. If you find any interest in it at all, go to the Wikipedia page. That's right. I said Wikipedia page because you don't need to have a doctorate in it. You need to have like a like understanding of its a existence. Wikipedia level knowledge. You need to have a <laughs> Wikipedia level knowledge like, hey, that's really interesting. I wonder where the term Kraken comes from. Oh, really? The Viking King of 1074? I had no idea. Um, it is I, impossible for me to watch any period piece movie without going to Wikipedia several times. <laughs> because you get curious. Like, I wonder how bullshit crap this is and you're like oh pretty 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 accurate or pretty garbage you know uh but for me it's it's things that they touch briefly upon they'll be like a character who's a real person sure they'll be in like five minutes of the movie they somehow contribute to the plot and then it's yeah. like and and they're gone and I, I have to like pause and be like what year did they die <laughs> <laughs> exactly and like again we don't need like i'm not saying you know dedicate the rest of your life to understanding stupid trivia <laughs> i mean that's my job but as give yourself a baseline of as breadth as you can. And that's that's step A. So that as your brain is categorizing things, it has to categorize a lot of random stuff and give it things that are prediction errors. If all if you're an accountant and all you do is math and numbers, then you should go take a pottery class. What good's that gonna do? Nothing. That's the point. Yeah, you're even talking on a macro level. I've heard that like on a micro hour to hour level. If you're doing something analytical on the computer, like you go throw a ball at a wall for 10 minutes and then come yeah. back, you know, it's yeah. to, to break up your, it's prediction errors. your brain. This, your brain lumps things together to try to make things efficient, hijack that, make it like, I have three hours of computing to do, cool. I am going to go play with a yo-yo in the stairwell for eight minutes, why? because it'll confuse your brain. We, remember we did a uh, video <laughs> video project about the, um, the TSA workers who That's inspect right. baggage and they're watching the screens um, with all the the x-rays, the x-ray machines. It changes blindness. They and become, they, the, yeah. the software every, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes, it changes. So like, imagine if you were using a word processor and like where you go file, save, imagine that button moving every 10 minutes, which sounds- You just described murder for me. I yeah, that like would I be will kill someone. terrible in that situation. But if you are, if it's your job to notice something unusual, they found that like, I'm the suitcase, 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 like your brain goes into automatic and it's just like suitcase, suitcase, gun, suitcase, and it like doesn't like bowling ball candle, even register. And, you know, and so, yeah, yeah they, they have intentionally made the program d does the mental version of throwing the ball at the wall. Right. It's it's it's, uh, it's like, OK, five minutes of this way. Now you're going to do five minutes of this way. And it, it's right. a, a way to break you out of that cycle. So step one, if if your brain is going to with your permission or not, lump things together. In the water, it's a fish. If it looks like a teddy bear, it must be one. If, if your brain is going to categorize things and, and make all these shortcuts and categorize, give it as much to categorize as possible. And on the macro level, give it lots of diverse things. On the micro level, play yo-yo in the middle of the day for a few minutes just to, just to it's a prediction error. Yeah. It makes your brain think differently. And then the second is subvert the expectations of your own categorizing system, which is to say, like, I, uh, I, I had to do a writing experiment in college where they're like, use a noun as a verb that you've never heard used as a verb before. I'm like, oh, I like that, <laughs> but it's, but, but it's a noun. They're like, right, make it a verb. I'm like, but it's a noun. They're like, right, make it a verb. See, it's really easy. I'm having trouble thinking of a noun that uh, it doesn't right, sound right. But I was 18 at the time. So <laughs> yeah. like, I was like, so the one that I came up with is like the sun greened the grass, like, like green's not a verb. But it works. No one with a it's higher level right. education wouldn't read that and know exactly what I meant. Yeah. The sun greened the grass. <laughs> um, and even though your English teacher might mark you off for it, like not a verb, um, you've you've managed communication. You've managed to force a connection that wasn't there. And so if you make sure that your brain is very, very willing to categorize lots of stuff and very, very willing to force connections that aren't obvious, you will actually develop that creative muscle. You will you will allow and um, you will not only allow, but you will encourage your brain to say, now, I know the square pegs and round holes like <laughs> there's a whole axiom about it, but but I bet I could make it fit. <laughs> or if, if you if you practice forcing things across categories, um, 
And I mean, and this can become ridiculous. Like, why couldn't an eight-year-old be president of the United States? Um, because he has nap time? No, 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 <laughs> let's talk about this. Why couldn't he? And you make a re- list of the reasons why he couldn't, and you make a list of the reasons why he could. And even though we all know how that's going to end, spending five minutes considering it forces your brain to always be readjusting why it's categorizing things. They're like, huh, they can't do that. They finish that sentence. All right, finish that sentence. <laughs> You'll find something interesting. Well, yeah. right now I'm going to find us a quick break and we will be right back. Cool. So let's wrap this up. What What's the lesson here? So this all my understanding of this concept came from when I was talking to Carmen Simon um, uh, when I was writing my book, I was I interviewed Carmen Simon. She's a uh, cognitive neuroscientist. And I think we talked about this a few weeks ago when she asked me, are you as creative as the strength of your memories? And 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 she had to explain to me that, you know, creativity is just misaligned memories. It's it's taking something that was been misnamed in your head or it's forcing a misconnection or it's it's grabbing things off the shelf. And I'm going to make a gumbo today and it's going to have like marshmallow syrup and shrimp. And you're like, ah, yeah, yeah, creativity and humor are pretty closely linked and that's where most humor comes from is subverting yeah. your expectations subverting expectations so so i asked her you know so when i kind of postulated theorized her, i was like so basically if you like the things i just said so you have to keep yourself nimble you have to keep yourself agile and you have to force these wrong connections she's like right even if they're bad connections and they'll never work practice making them work yeah. practice forcing that she's like if you really want to get creative start taking pictures on your phone like every day and start journaling every day. But she's like, that's the first part. It's like most people already do that already. They they post on social media. They they take some pictures. She's like, but the real, real trick is go back and read it. Go back and revisit that you need because your brain is cataloging what it thinks is important and what you notice during the day won't necessarily be the same thing. So if a year later you back and read your social media posts or look at the pictures on your phone and then try to remember all the weird things about that day, the sights, the smells, the tastes, the sounds, it's it's keeping that that breadth of information. It's keeping those categories fresh and alive. And one day when you're sitting and you're doing your boring DNA processor for a forensics lab and you suddenly have this idea, it's like, wait, I saw this on the Discovery Channel about Alexander the eight, you know, Henry the Eighth's wives. If we do this other thing by having this breadth of knowledge that seems misaligned, it allows for your brain to make radical connections that other people haven't seen because so many people just we categorize and we move on. We categorize and we move on. And we it's cinnamon snaps, synapse and synonyms. We just we take words that kind of mean the same thing. Annihilate, decimate, eradicate. Yeah, they just mean kill um, in large number. Uh, and so the trick is we have to constantly be adding to our buckets all across the board and constantly readdressing our buckets and encouraging those buckets to not be there. And and that is is quite literally from a cognition standpoint, it'll help with cognitive dissonance because you'll start understanding how things actually work together. But it's where creativity actually comes from. This this thing that causes cognitive dissonance is actually, if we force it, is is how how we get creative. Yeah, I don't uh, I don't write in journals, but you know me, I love taking photographs. I have a ton of you thousands know, family photographs. And th- these days, everybody has a phone. It's pretty easy. But even back in the pre smartphone days, I always used to you know, carry a camera with me. Um, and of course, it's even easier now. And yeah, I like to go back, like you said, go back a year. And I find that if I have taken photos on a particular day, I will then a year later remember more about that day. And it's not things I didn't even take a photo of. Right. So it's like, well, I'll be on a job or something. And I will Those always links, take like six six pictures and then a year later I'll look at it and I'll be like oh yeah you remember like around the corner there was this weird water fountain that leaked and it like made a sparking sound and like you know like I'll have these memories come back and I I didn't take a picture of the water fountain (laughs) but I took a picture of the car outside the door of the water fountain and your brain and like if I hadn't taken that picture though I would have forgotten about the weird water fountain say I was just watching some videos that you and I made in college like quite literally 20 years ago and same exact thing is like, oh, I remember that day and they're not in any of the shots. They're not anything like I remember the smell of the hallway. I remember the things that that had nothing to do with it. And as long as you are keeping your past alive in your head and keeping the breath, it's that liberal arts education that we look sneery at now. But just because you being a super duper 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 expert in a thing doesn't mean 
you have any understanding outside of that thing. And if you can't apply it, Ansel Adams could have been the most brilliant photographer ever, but if he didn't have an understanding and a love of the outdoors, we wouldn't know who Ansel Adams was. Him knowing every inch of a camera wouldn't help. What if, uh, what if Audubon had been uh, a big fan of drawing soup cans? He would have been Andy Warhol 100 years earlier, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and we still wouldn't know much about birds. Like, so Yeah, the combinations are just fascinating. It, it, it really is. And so the, the true genius isn't in the talent, but it's in the talent and the interest and the understanding. And those are always breath, deep breaths of knowledge. And, and, you know, just I think that, you know, kind of in my ending closing of, of when I looked into something while studying this, I found something really interesting. Um, savants, as they're, or idiot savants, as they are sometimes kind of pejoratively referred to, these people that are holy crap brilliant have in history, and you could argue, well, Mozart, like, there, there's a lot of caveats to this, but for the most part, savants have changed the world very seldom. Mm -hmm. Because what they have is a near perfect understanding of the system. And all changes, radical changes, come from subverting the system, come from adding to it, changing it, defying it, breaking it, putting it back together. And you can't do that with a perfect, perfect understanding of the system. You can only do that by not caring about the system at all. It's, it's the, um, the ones who are best at playing the game, we, we laud for being the best at it. Right. It's the people who break the game who make history. <laughs> right. Like the people that are like, that's not supposed to be possible. Like, yeah, that's what makes it better. So if you want to truly find your creativity through cognition, break those barriers on purpose. Find ways to use nouns as verbs is a really quick one. If you're, you know, if you're a mathematician, go and take a pottery class and learn the yo-yo because it's, it's exercising a different part of your brain and it is forcing misconnections and then actively encourage misconnections. It's good advice uh, across the board. <laughs> yeah. Well, we will uh, wrap this up and next week be back with more Release the Creative. We will see you soon. Thanks for joining us here at Release the Creative. Kirk here would never say it to your face, but he thinks you should like and subscribe to us on YouTube. And Jeff is far too shy to admit it, but he thinks you should subscribe to us on your favorite podcast reader. Yeah? Well, you're the one who's always saying that everyone should give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. Why do you have to make everything so difficult? <laughs>